Hi, this is George Lucas. I'm the director of Revenge of the Sith, the third installment in the Star Wars saga. This was uh, done in the style of a 1930s um, Saturday matinee serial, which were usually in 12 episodes. Everything is done in that style. Um, everything from the acting to the design of the crawl to the, even the story elements are based on a, a particular style that was very, very prevalent in the 30s. In this particular shot, because this sequence goes on for a number of minutes, this is probably the longest continuous shot, single shot, in any of the films. I wanted something that says war, uh, introduced our two main characters, which we can recognize by the two ships, and uh, establishes the fact that there's a battle, but sort of reveal things one at a time. Now that we have digital technology, we can actually do a shot like this, which we struggled and struggled and struggled with back in the old days. So this was sort of a way of making our dreams come true at ILM and also just as a filmmaker. The piece flying out of the explosion and hitting that Star Cruiser is a... Uh... It's a kitchen sink. The Islander said there was so much in this shot that there was everything in it but the kitchen sink. So now we put a kitchen sink. This shot uh, we established, I, I've got to set up the fact that the clones exist. So the shot with the two clones, you see both of them and they look kind of like, it's a subtle way of setting up the reality of clones. A lot of exposition that's going on in this first few shots. Everything from early X-Wings to uh, old vulture droids, um, and then to make an exciting sequence that um, has some suspense in it. I wanted to do a different kind of space battle sequence, so we invented these little droids that come out of the missiles. It was just a different way of approaching the missiles blowing things up, and I wanted to do something that was a little bit more interesting and odd. The point to this beginning here is that we now establish that Obi-Wan and Anakin are partners, that Anakin is no longer a Padawan learner, that they're friends, and they rely on each other, which is important to develop so that when we get toward the end of the movie, we understand the tragedy of them having to fight each other. This sets up that they're equals, even though Anakin kind of makes a few mistakes, Obi-Wan makes a few mistakes, one isn't significantly more in charge than the other which is the important part of the sequence. I also like the idea of having a little duel between R2 and one of the buzz droids so that we could make R2 more of a hero. This is his action picture, and so any time I had a chance to put R2 in an action sequence, I tried to do it, because I knew in the first half I had a chance to do that, but then in the second half, the droids, almost everybody drifts away. Every movie has, I have a bad feeling about this. It's sort of our little joke line. This whole rescue bit is about 20 minutes of the movie. Originally, it kind of had more action in it. It was a little bit more intense, but then I decided to give it some breaks. So we have an action sequence and then a little bit of a break from all of that to kind of get our wits about us. And then I go into another action sequence and then another break. But taken as a whole, it was meant to be one long, intense action sequence. This sequence in the elevator is as much to, again, give R2 a little bit of space and give him a chance to be in the movie. I love R2 and I wanted to get a chance to you know, have some fun with him at the very beginning of the movie when I knew I still had time to do that. And again, build up the relationship between Anakin and Obi-Wan because I wanted to make sure people felt they were very comfortable with each other and friendly with each other and sort of had gotten over this uh, petulant rivalry that existed in the last movie. There was a lot of discussion to pull this sequence out of the movie, but it's one of my favorite sequences and I refuse to let it go. And I like R2. From my point of view, I think this is for R2 the funniest sequence for all the R2 fans which I'm one of the biggest ones. I had Christopher Lee for one day, and he was having a hard time doing fighting. So we shot all these close-ups of the dialogue and the very extreme close-ups. The major issue here is I put Dooku in after Darth Maul was killed to establish that the Emperor's assistant, or the other Sith, could take Jedi and convert them. In this particular case, the idea is that Palpatine is testing Anakin to see if he's strong enough to become his apprentice. And he doesn't tell Dooku what he's actually up to. Dooku thinks he's just going to fight him. But the whole thing is a setup by the Emperor to test Anakin's strength. And when Anakin is strong enough, which he proves to be by killing Dooku, 
then the emperor is ready to convert him over to the dark side to become his new apprentice. You can see that Palpatine is interested in separating Anakin from Obi-Wan. There were a few other scenes where he was doing what he could with gossip and whatnot to make Anakin not trust Obi-Wan, but in the end I felt it was sort of overdoing it. The sequence with the battleships at each other is from a, an old pirate movie or an old seafaring movie from the 1700s where the two battleships go next to each other in this point-blank range trying to blow each other out of space. It's the kind of battle we haven't actually seen in Star Wars. I thought it would be a good way of uh, getting us into the situation where the ship has to crash land. This was a complicated sequence. It went on quite a bit more also before we trimmed it down. They had different experiences in the elevator, different experiences in the hangar. But this whole opening piece, actually, I think when we first cut it together, it was about an hour. And we had to cut it down to less than a half an hour. It's not nearly as exciting when it's longer. Sometimes shortness is best. I like the idea of doing a ratio. And I like the idea of these guys falling into a very simple trap that you think is a trap. But then later on, you realize that they want to get Palpatine, but they also want to get rid of Grievous. And this is sort of the fastest way to get there. With General Grievous, I wanted somebody who was reminiscent, again, of what Anakin is going to become, which is a half-man, half-robot. In this case, Grievous is sort of a 20% alien, 80% robot. Grievous, to us, was always this sickly character. And so this coughing that he has and this hunched movement that he has, for George at least, referred to sort of how this creature inside this droid wasn't fully working. The systems hadn't been perfected yet. It echoes what is about to occur with Anakin as a part machine, part life form. We worked on giving him a character for a long time, tested lots of different actors for the role, and finally I heard a tape by this one actor who was named Alan Smithy, which is the name that directors use when they take their name off a picture. And I liked this voice the best. It turned out to be Matt Wood, the ADR recordist and sound editor, and he did the best performance. I worked to build more character in with him because when we were recording, I happened to have bronchitis. And so we did a few takes where I just sat there and coughed. In that way, we sort of built this more interesting character. To give you a little sense of, you know, the fact that he's in that robot suit for a reason when he was obviously damaged goods. But I didn't want it to be like Darth Vader. I wanted it to be something slightly different. You wouldn't have that sort of artificial breathing sound. I just wanted to have somebody with asthma. One of the big issues behind Grievous was that I didn't want a, a big, powerful villain. I wanted a cunning, you know, almost cowardly villain who um, isn't super strong or super powerful, but at the same time, you know, as a good fighter, but not, I, I didn't want to get somebody bigger and stronger and more powerful than the other villains that we've had, and keep, you know, going to the next level. I wanted him to be slightly more like the Emperor, you know, slightly more on the sleazy, behind the scenes kind of guy. That's why I set up the fact that he always runs at the end of every fight. He always gets away. This shot where we come right up into the ship is a concept shot, homage to Steve. Spielberg, because he loves shots like this. I don't usually do them. This is actually the first real dialogue scene in the movie where you get to get a little of the banter between them and establish their relationship in a you know more verbal way. Ewan, in each film, kept advancing his accent and his delivery to be a little bit more like Alec Guinness every time so that it would grow into matching into the episode four. So as he gets older, he gets to be more and more like Alec Guinness. This was a tricky set because the pillars, if you actually laid them out on a floor plan, they didn't look very good. So we had to move them around in a funny kind of way so they look good from shot to shot because this whole set is digital. Padme's hairdo was done to be slightly reminiscent of her daughter in the next movie, but in a more elegant fashion. Princess Leia's outfit is a little bit more Pancho Villa, Spanish revolutionary in style, but still with the emphasis on what has commonly been called the earmuff motif. This one actually is a little bit more into the Hopi Indian style, a little bit away from the Mexican style revolutionary woman, but her daughter becomes much more of a revolutionary. That was the style that we used for her, so I've drifted more toward that because her mother is the one that actually starts the rebel alliance. We used one of the ships from an earlier episode to establish the separatists because 
We didn't want to update the ship too much. We wanted to be able to get the familiarity of the fact that the Trade Federation use pretty much the same ships throughout the episodes. And this one especially has made it become synonymous with the bad guys. And this is really to establish the base on Utapau and that the corporate guilds are there. And also that the Dark Lord of the Sith is still in charge of what's going on around here. And this is still being orchestrated by him. The, the scene on the balcony of Padme's apartment was actually shot later. Because after I cut the film together, I realized that we didn't really have enough time with them together in a normal situation. Everything after this becomes a little bit more threatening and intense. And I needed something that just showed them in their normal life and focused on their dreams, their hopes and dreams for their future, which were really centered around the children or the child at this point, since they don't know they're twins. You know, as a way of just settling into a normal life before it all starts to fall apart, which it does in the next scene. There was a lot of discussion around whether I should actually show one of these dreams, but I felt it was important we refer to one in the last movie, but since this one centers around Padme, I wanted to bring the audience into the dreamland so that we got a little bit more in a next step up of what's going on with his uh, premonitions. And this is a scene that was designed originally to be a little bit more at dawn, but we had so many dawn scenes that I decided that I would make this more night, and so we darkened it down quite a bit. And I think it makes it a slightly more ominous scene this way. Something that was really, uh, partly was accomplished at, when we composited the shots together, and partly was done in the timing itself after the film was finished. This is a scene that describes the overall plot, the sort of overriding issue of her death and the dilemma they're in because they're not supposed to be married. The sort of domestic crisis that is the underpinning of the whole movie before the Emperor enters into it and turns him to the dark side. But the reason he turns to the dark side is laid out in that scene where they discuss the dilemma of and fear that he has of losing her. It gave us a great scene between Yoda and Anakin, and for me it explained a lot of what Anakin was going through, and it used Yoda and his wisdom to help Anakin. To underline the dilemma that Anakin has of his fear of loss of Padme. It's fear of losing somebody he loves, which is the flip side of greed. Greed in terms of the Emperor, it's the greed for power, absolute power over everything. The shadow of greed. With Anakin, it's really the power to save the one he loves, but it's basically going against the fates and what is natural. You fear to lose. But once he thinks he's going to get that power, it begins to occur to them and he could have the power to be the emperor of the universe, just even more powerful. So once you get a little bit of power, then it leads to wanting more power and more power. You know, the classic power corrupts. Well, it, this is power corrupts in action. When he goes for something simple, although not too simple, but bringing somebody back from the dead, he realized he could have the power to do anything he wants. This is a move by Palpatine to begin to cause trouble between Anakin and the Council by putting him on the Council. Palpatine is, he's inserted himself between the Senate and the, and the Council, because normally these, the Jedi Council report to the Senate. And as the head of the Senate, that sort of reporting to him, but not he just sort of intensifies that situation so that the Jedi Council would report directly to him. When um, I first started making the film, it was during the Vietnam War, and it was during a period when Nixon was going for a third term, or trying to get the Constitution changed to go for a third term, and it got me to thinking about how democracies turn into dictatorships, not how they're taken over, or how there's a coup, or anything like that, but how the democracy turns itself over to a to a tyrant and uh, so i went back and i looked at how after the senate in ancient rome kills caesar they turn around and give the empire over to his nephew and make him emperor and then at the same time it's with the french revolution after they've uh, gone to all this trouble to have a revolution and get rid of the king and all the people in power Eventually, they turn the democracy over to Napoleon and make him the emperor. So it, it has to do more with a historical precedence, and it does happen a lot, more than one would think. Usually, it, you think that it's one group that takes over. And we, in the modern, the 20th century, it was very much of the banana republic reality, where a general takes over. The, takes over. But 
um, and does it by force. But it's more interesting when it's actually given over to kind of compensate for the fact that the elected representatives can't agree on anything and are corrupt. And therefore, in order to clean up the mess, somebody is allowed to come in and fix things. And? In this particular scene with Obi-Wan and Anakin, we're establishing the fact that there is a tension between the Jedi and Palpatine, the Supreme Chancellor. And that tension between the two of them results in Anakin getting caught in the middle. Palpatine knew this when he put him in the position of being on the Jedi Council, because he knew that the Council would resent it. And Anakin even knew the council would resent it. But when he's actually put in that position, it begins to create a huge amount of tension, ultimately, between the council and Anakin. And even though Anakin's still loyal to the council, he's in a tough spot. I always loved the lighting in this sequence. And for me, it was a sequence between these three powerful master Jedi. And for George, it was also an homage to Seven Samurai, the shot specifically. George had asked us to do the, that head rub. The lead samurai in that picture has to shave his head to pretend that he's a monk, and he's constantly sort of rubbing his newly shaved head, and that's where that little affectation for Yoda came from. This scene is set up to establish that the pressure that Anakin is under is beginning to divide Anakin and Padme, that she has these values of democracy and how things should be that Anakin is starting to be confused about. You can begin to see Anakin's loyalty is to the Chancellor, not to the Senate, and not necessarily to democracy. And for her to challenge what Palpatine is doing upsets him quite a bit because it's attacking his friend and his mentor. And he's getting in a state of confusion because of the pressures being put on him from various quarters. There are some scenes that were cut out where, from this point on, we begin to see Padme become involved in the Rebel Alliance. And there's scenes with her and Mon Mothma and Bail Organa where they begin to start the Rebel Alliance, which is really a way of them forming a group in the Senate to counter what is going on with the Chancellor. The scene at the opera here, it was fun to be able to do a large scene with everybody dressed up. I put my two daughters in the hallway, and they said they wouldn't do it unless I was in the scene with them. So I ended up with a blue face standing talking to my younger daughter while my oldest daughter is in the center talking to her boyfriend. This scene was originally written to be in Palpatine's office, and I'd already done four scenes in the office. And to do another scene with him just sitting down in the office talking just wasn't going to hold together. And then George came up with the idea of, well, what about, you know, an event? And by 10 o'clock that night, we had really settled on the opera. The opera was going to be Dust Squid. Um, it would be in Palpatine's opera box. I got the art department to give me some chairs, to build some chairs for me overnight, literally. And then we put him on some blue uh, platforms, and uh, I called up ILM, and we started designing this what we call the uh, the water ballet. Uh, we call it Squid Lake, done by the Mon Calamari dancers because it's uh, Admiral Akbar's home planet ballet troupe. There's two real seduction scenes here, and this is one of them, and it's a very long scene, and it needs to play out in a very uh, methodical way which is very un-Star Wars-like. By getting in a new environment, I think it adds enough interest to make you focus on the dialogue and on what's going on without getting bored. I love Ian in this scene. Ian actually uh, had laryngitis this day and could barely talk, but he managed to get through the day. He was, you know, losing his voice, and we were going through the scene, and it actually gave him an interesting quality, voice quality, that is unique to this particular scene, and we, and we did not loop this scene. I kept it originally because I really liked the, the way it plays out. The political intrigue that's going on through all the movies, or at least the first three, is fairly opaque in the first two. And it has to do with commercial interests and corporate reality and the machinations of the Senate. And, and it's, it's also Palpatine's rise from just a senator to a chancellor, and then now from a chancellor to an emperor. And so the, the political machinations are meant to be kind of political, which is you don't quite understand what's going on or what the issues are. And, but now I think when you see where it all leads to, 
what's going on in the first two films is much more apparent because it's really designed to set this scene up where we spill the beans about what's going on politically. But it's been built up through the whole thing. And you'll see in 4, 5, and 6, the other movies, there's remnants of this political situation that are also in those films. So it's, it's a complete circle, and it runs throughout the whole, the whole thing, which gives you the sense of where things are going to go after you know, episode six, which is that the Senate will come back and it'll become a democracy again, because now we know what a democracy was when it started, which was really in episode one, even though it was not very effective because of the corruption and the petty fighting. The other aspect of this is that it begins to set up even further the hologram transmissions about how these guys have meetings, but some of them are holograms and some of them are not. This time I did it from the other side. Normally you just see the Jedi Temple with a few holograms in there. Now you get to see it from Yoda's side. This is the last scene in the movie with Obi-Wan and Anakin where they're still friends. I wanted at this one time to sort of have this overhanging reality of the fact that their relationship has been strained that Anakin is trying to repair it, that Obi-Wan is a very strong central figure. He's the rock, and he doesn't get upset in the same emotional way that Anakin does and is able to repair it and try to caution for calm and thoughtful response to things. Be patient, Anakin. It will not be long before the Council makes you a Jedi Master. But there's also, at the end of this, we begin to see that while Anakin appears that he feels good about the relationship, he really doesn't. He's worried about what they think of him, and we'll see in the next scene after this that he's he's concerned about his motivations for things and his confusion and, and upset the fact that Council and Obi-Wan don't trust him. This is a great shot. I love that. I remember when you showed me this the first time, just adding the camera shake. Well, what we've done in some of these scenes is that we put a little bit of reality into it, which is a ship that big going by would shake the camera a bit, and it gives you a heightened sense of reality. For this film, George wanted to see the clones without their helmets on. So Tamura Morrison, the actor, was shot wearing a blue suit, and then very carefully we matched in digital costumes. But this is really designed to set up the reality of the clones, which we hinted at in the very beginning of the movie, but this is the one to really establish the fact that all the guys in those suits are all the same guy. They're all basically Jango Fett uh, or clones of Jango Fett so that you don't get confused about the fact the same guy is all over the place. Because Anakin has been having some difficulty with Obi-Wan, this is to begin to set up that his nightmare about Padme also begins to involve Obi-Wan and that there's some jealousy between him and Obi-Wan about Padme and he senses that uh, Obi-Wan has been there to talk to her, and he's struggling with his confusion of the fact that he's, in essence, emotionally unbalanced at this point. He is confused by Palpatine, he's confused by the Council, he's confused because he doesn't want to lose Padme, he is, thinks he's figured out a way to get new powers that can maybe save her life, but he knows, in essence, that's probably wrong. So there's a lot of mixed feelings in this whole scene here. It's also one of the few sets that we built, and it was built exactly as the set in the other movies to establish her home apartment. This is one of my favorite characters. This was all done with makeup. It's a great design for a character and, and also a costume. We wanted to have these creatures in this world be a little bit different, but not so much so that it was, you know, the cliched aliens. But the little guys that work on the ship are one of my favorites. They used to work with the dragons. We had a scene with the dragons, but we cut it out, and I decided I wanted to keep those guys in, so I moved them over to work on this platform. The idea is that all of the citizens of this world live on the walls of these enormous sinkholes that go into their planet. The idea specifically was that the lizards that we see on this planet are actually native to this world, and that they have evolved to be able to crawl and clamber up the walls of these sinkholes. Every time you have a thing like this, you have to come up with a culture and how that culture functions and what their aesthetic is. But when we introduce the droids, and specifically Grievous's unicycle later on, you'll see that they tear apart at the world, that they're not part of this world, and that they don't coexist with this nature very well. There was a lot more in this film with Boga, the, the giant lizard, 
But again, it was one of those things where we got so infatuated with a little offshoot of an idea that the story gets lost and we have to sort of rein ourselves in and focus on the story and slow down on having a good time. And I'd always wanted to do an actual sequence with a Jedi riding an animal other than a Tauntaun, which was not really a Jedi. I wanted to do it with a Jedi with a sword and the whole medieval look and feel to it. And this was my chance to do that. I especially the score in this area. Johnny Williams' music really adds a certain bizarre quality to the way this whole thing works. Because it's a theme we're really familiar with, but it's done sort of in minor chords and with a different you know, arrangement. And it really is a, a kind of eerie, nice feel to this whole sequence as he sneaks up on General Grievous. Hello there. Now this when he jumps down into the room and uh, says hello there is a direct appropriation of the line where Alec Guinness first comes into the movie and sees R2 and says hello there. So we wanted to do that one little tip to where we were going with the character and with Alec Guinness. We're always looking for something unique with these villains and even though he's a He's a kind of slimy villain who runs. We wanted to give him some kind of extra feature, and the idea of his hands could be apart and having four laser swords instead of you know a double laser sword or some of the other opponents we've had uh, seemed like a, a really fun idea. Well, the trick part of this it was very hard to shoot because we have a stuntman being General Grievous, but obviously he only had two hands. And to develop a, a way of fighting where actually Ewan had to learn how to do this thing, and the stuntman did one section of one hand and the other section of the other hands to kind of give him a sense and an idea what it'd be like to fight somebody with four hands, you know, four things. But it's still a kind of tricky maneuver. We we did end up cutting the extra two swords off pretty quickly in the sequence. One of the larger parts of this sequence was. Obi-Wan on a lizard chasing Grievous on a mechanical scooter. And when Steve Spielberg was bored, I let him storyboard some of these sequences. And we sent Dan Gregoire, our animatic supervisor, to New York. And they came up with this outrageous chase sequence. But it was about 40 minutes long. It was just magnificent. I mean, it was like a whole separate movie. But it just didn't make sense to go off on an edge and shoot it when there's still the story of Anakin and Palpatine to deal with. We had this running gag of Obi-Wan constantly reminding Anakin throughout these things of not losing his lightsaber and methodically through all these films the Jedi have a, an interesting way of losing their lightsabers uh, which is kind of a running gag. I love Sam Jackson this scene. He carries such force with him in his scenes. This is a very short little scene that shows the direction that the Jedi are going that the Chancellor is or the Emperor is anticipating and uses really to seduce ultimately Anakin in the next scene. Originally this was written where Anakin was actually seduced in this scene and he became the Sith pretty much in this scene. At the end, in this one, he, when faced with the reality, he stays a Jedi and he says, I'll get to the bottom of this and I'm going to turn you in. But originally it wasn't like that. It was he kind of got more sucked into the idea of becoming a Sith Lord and saving his wife. And it just didn't play that well in terms of how fast he converted. So it seemed to make a lot more sense to have him stay loyal to the Jedi as long as possible, which meant later on in the scene with the fight with Mace, we redid that scene. And at first, there wasn't the part where the Emperor gives up and says, oh, you got me, you got me. It was basically the scene without that, where it just gets more intense, and then finally Anakin breaks down and saves him. But it didn't have the same thing as that pause in there where you think that uh, and it also makes the Emperor a lot more slimy. It's really fun. To, it's a fun, dramatic thing to deal with. Once I got rid of Obi-Wan's uh, sword, I thought it would be funny for Obi-Wan to use the staff and ultimately use the gun, the, the weapon that most Jedi sustain the most to kill the villain. It's the least likely weapon for him to end up destroying Grievous with. Mostly this was a play on a Jedi with a gun, which you don't ever see anywhere else. This was another scene that was added after I changed that scene in the office. Because once I had Anna could say that he was going to go tell the Jedi, I actually had to shoot a scene of him going and telling the Jedi. There was a lot of good factors that happened when I changed that. It strengthens a scene when, when Mace comes in. I mean, it meant that when Mace entered the room with Palpatine, he knew that he was a Sith Lord. It works actually much better that when he comes through that door, he knows that he's going to arrest him. He knows that he's the bad guy. 
which works a lot better. After this scene, I needed something that sort of remind people that the real issue here is trying to save Padme, and that that's what its conflict is, and that's why he's emotionally going back and forth, and it's very easy to have the audience believe that Anakin is miffed because he doesn't get to go on the mission, that you know, he's angry because he's not a master, and this scene is really designed to remind you that his real problem is that he just doesn't want a loser, and he knows that if the Emperor is killed, then any chance he has of saving her is going to be gone. The Emperor is his only hope to, to saving her, which obviously drives him back to the Emperor's office. But it wasn't really until I cut it all together and looked at it that I said, okay, now this is, I can see what the problem is and how to solve it. Then I added this thing where he goes back to the Jedi Temple and comes back to the office rather than staying there. I needed something that was just about them. And at this point, as I laid the movie out, it was very clear that we needed to be reminded why Anakin was turning, although it was you know, put in there very strongly. It, it uh, wasn't strong enough. There was a great deal of work put in on these sword fights because there's so many of them that we had to make each one individual. Each one have its own personality that reflected the two opponents and their skills and how they would adjust. You know, the sword fight between Palpatine and Mace is different than the one between the Emperor and Yoda, even though we wanted to have sort of similarities but make them different enough to where they don't get incredibly repetitious the most this has got more sword fighting in it than all the other movies put together this shot where Anakin walks through that little antechamber is my one of my favorite shots because the whole thing is a map painting okay well this sequence uh, always started out with Mace uh, overpowering Palpatine and then Palpatine using his powers to try to destroy Mace and Mace deflecting his rays with his lightsaber and it always was that Anakin cut the lightsaber out of his hand. But this part where he he pretends to lose his power and be weak was something that I added later. Because this is the it moved the point where Anakin turns down to this moment right here. And you can see that he's now that it's very clear that he's he, he wants him to go on trial so he can pump him for information about how to get these powers. Sam Jackson wanted a very spectacular death, so that was the only thing he requested of in a purple laser sword. So uh, it was an easy thing to do in the nature of this, the way the sequence works, but uh, he was very involved, and he just didn't want to be killed in the dead of night, you know, stabbed in the back or something. <laughs> in this sequence, we lowered the Emperor's voice to make this transition stronger and to make it creepier. Because so Natalie comes back and he's all looking weird. We wanted him to sound weird also. And then we very slowly take him back to his normal Emperor voice, which is a little bit different than his Palpatine voice. But that's more of an acting thing. This is actually, technically, we added a little reverb and made it sound a little creepier. Because we wanted this scene to have a little extra creepiness because it is Rise, or Rise Lord Vader is again one of those key moments in the movie that you want to have a little bit more theatrical than anything else. This is where he makes the pact with the devil. This is the very Faustian pact of trying to, to do something that he shouldn't be doing. You know, he's gone over the line. The killing of Mace, he didn't he was trying to stop him from killing Palpatine, which in essence was the right thing to do. He didn't realize that Palpatine was going to kill him. So in the, up to that point, he was trying to do the right thing. But now he realizes by having Mace be dead that he's crossed over the line and that he sort of succumbs and says, yes, you know, I'll do anything you ask if you allow me to keep my wife alive. Then he says, okay, well, now I'll do that, but now you have to go and do all these things. You have to go kill all the Jedi, because if you don't kill all the Jedi, uh, even if you leave one alive, even if it's one of the little kids, they'll come back and get us, and we'll be dealing with this forever. So none of them can survive. It's the same thing with the Sith. The issue with the Sith is there's always two Sith, but until you've gotten rid of both of them, you haven't gotten rid of any of them because they can always create more of them. So you have to get rid of the Emperor and his apprentice. One of the issues in all of this is that the bad guys think they're good and Lord Sidious thinks he's bringing peace to the galaxy because there's so, so much corruption and confusion and chaos going on. And then now he's going to be able to straighten everything out, which may be true, but the price 
the galaxy is going to have to pay for it is way too much. The telling of this story of Anakin going into the Jedi Temple and the other Jedi getting killed through the Order 66 of the clones is just done as kind of one of those inevitable payoffs in terms of getting rid of everybody, the Emperor that's getting rid of all his enemies. But there's a certain inevitability about it all and a sadness to it. I was always worried in episode two that I was giving away too much in terms of people asking questions about where did the clones really come from? Because if you go back, they mention the fact that Lord Tyrannus and Count Dooku are the same person, you know, Darth Tyrannus, and that Darth Tyrannus is the one who started the clones. So if you're paying attention, it's very easy to figure out what's going to happen to the clones. I mean, that they're going to be the ones that betray everybody. It's tough to put in things like that without giving everything away. This is one of my favorite planets. When I mean, we finally got a chance to create a completely otherworldly environment, Usually it's based on some kind of reality, but this one we went out a little bit further, a little more fantasy-like, which I enjoyed. And it's, it's always a little tricky to do that without making it look dated and funny and weird, but uh, I think we managed to pull it off for a very brief moment there. So one of my favorite Wookiee fighting shots. <laughs> I love the fact that they're flying around on those things and the wind is blowing. The thing with the kids was very necessary to establish you know, how far down the road he'd come to do something that this brutal and barbaric. And it had to be in there, but I definitely didn't want to show it. It was really in the editorial process that the idea of intercutting her with him at that moment where he's at his very worst with her worrying about him. That juxtaposition works quite well because it reflects as much on the slaughter of the children as it does on her concern about him, even though she doesn't know that the children are being slaughtered. Yeah, but it gives you this very strong emotional connection when those two sequences are pushed up against each other. This actually is one of my favorite digital scenes. All these troopers are digital, and they, the acting in it is so good, so realistic. Just the little moves and the... It's still the nuance of it is fantastic. This is my son who is still a little boy when he did this and now he's six feet tall two years later there's a real art to doing wipes you know you really have to be very careful about what is the story elements that you're telling so that the transition could be very soft or very hard and then what are the two shots that you're going from and to so that the graphics of the shots play into the wipe i wanted to add this little scene in of yoda saying goodbye to the wookies give the wookies a chance to also have some scene other than battle in the movie where we got to know him and also acknowledge that it is Chewbacca. It's mostly just to give recognition to Chewbacca and let the Wookiees have a little bit of a dialogue scene together. One can now assume that the Wookiees all leave the planet and go off and find mercenary jobs throughout the galaxy, being co-pilots and smuggler ships and things like that. It's interesting, this set in a lot of the screenings has gotten a huge reaction and it, I, at first, I didn't know what they were reacting to, but then I realized it was the set. As we go on, you'll see that the set really establishes the beginning of the next movie. The last dialogue in this movie is R2 and 3PO, and uh, they're in the same location as they are in the beginning of the next film when they have the first dialogue. This is where we move into a bit of a montage. This, the scenes in this section of the movie, after the scene here with uh, uh, Padme and Anakin, start to move pretty quickly. A lot of very short scenes. It's very hard to write this sort of thing. You really have to see it on the screen to see how you intermix the scenes and how you intercut them to get the maximum emotional impact. I like this scene because he's lying to her and he's rationalizing it at the same time. You know, by saying he's doing it all for her. He's you know he's loyal to the Senate and Chancellor and her, but in the end, I mean, he's twisted every fact to his own rationale to make it seem like it's okay. But in the process of lying to her, he's actually just lying to himself and rationalizing his behavior. Because he knows he's wrong, but he won't admit it. But for me, this is a scene that says that she could never fall in love with him. I mean, she, I mean, she's obviously in love with him, but she could never live with him. Because he's too far gone that he could murder a bunch of kids and then go and rationalize it to her. It's, just doing his job. It was an eerie experience working on this set because it's like Tatooine. It's one of those, such an iconic set. It's like being thrown back in time 30 years. Here we are in Mustafar. 
I knew I had to have a volcanic planet, and I knew I had to have a, a society there, and that they'd be sort of capturing energy, but I didn't quite know what the energy would be or how they would do it. So there was a fair amount of time spent trying to solve just technical problems on this planet. You know, what is the culture like? How does it work? How do they make their living? What do they get paid for? What is their purpose there? They, they collect energy. That's what I decided they would be doing here. And those arms are collectors. And then they would also collect heat. I mean, they collect the lava. Uh, and they process the lava and test it, things like that. But the primary issue here is collecting the energy. Behind everything in the movie, there has to be a reason and a logic and a culture. And then all the design work goes on around that culture and the language and the costumes and the vehicles, everything sort of flows from that original concept of what is the culture? What kind of a culture are they? What is their mores? And you know, there's two very different cultures in this movie. One is Mustafar and the other is Utapau. And they have a very different philosophy about life. In episode four, I had Chewbacca yelling at a little mouse droid, and so I decided to do a little tip of the hat to that sequence by having these little baby mice droid being afraid of Anakin as he comes into the into the control room here. This shot of Yoda as he puts his sword away is we went over and over and over that to get the right expression on his face because it's a it's a it's a fairly important moment and there was self-satisfaction, and there was worry, and then there was, you know, kind of too much strength, and to get just the right feel about how he, how he's approaching all this, that was a, a very tough, seemingly very simple thing to do, but a very tough thing to actually pull off. This is a piece that's a little bit of a tip to the Godfather. This is where, in the Godfather, he's doing the uh, christening of the baby, and at the same time, killing all of his enemies and that's kind of what's going on here is the emperor is declaring the empire at the same time he's wiping out the last of his allies really it's contrasting those two events against each other which always works it's nice to be able to have one guy doing something rather benign and the other one being very physical and active in terms of the 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 real horror of this situation, the real awful part of the situation is him declaring the empire. As contrasted to Anakin, who's actually wiping everybody out, cutting people in half, and doing really terrible things. But it's not nearly as terrible as what the emperor is doing. And he's just doing it with words. You know, this was written a long time ago, and it was based on history. All of Star Wars is reasonably political. It's just that most people never noticed it until this episode was put into the puzzle. Sometimes the it's. You know, the, the politics are kind of confused and muddled in terms of the way people see it, which is the way most people see politics. But it's because they're confused and muddled that people don't want to have anything to do with it. But, of course, if they don't want to have anything to do with it, that's why uh, they end up turning to somebody to take over and clean it all up. Uh, so the involvement here of the Trade Federation and the Commerce Guilds and all these corporations who basically are having too much influence over the Senate, which allows them not to be able to do their job, is what actually starts this whole mess. And Palpatine is able to utilize that corruption and that greed on the part of the Trade Federation to further his purposes. And obviously, he is the one that is encouraging the Trade Federation to separate from the Republic and take a bunch of the systems with them that they have a lot of influence over. But all that doesn't become really apparent until you see that he's been using everybody and everything to really achieve the ultimate power. I love Ewan's performances in these ending sequences because he's inevitably drawn toward a very horrible reality that he has to participate in. And there's nothing he can do about it. He doesn't want to do it, but he has to keep continuing down that path because that's his destiny, so to speak, because he's sworn you know, to be a Jedi and to, and to bring justice to the galaxy. And now he's faced with the only way he can do that is to confront his friend, who has also decided that he's going to bring justice to the galaxy. 
So they're both trying to do the same thing. Only one is doing it out of strength and power and doing things he knows are wrong. And the other one's doing the inevitable thing that he has to do that he really doesn't want to have to do, which is to get rid of his friend. In this scene with Padme, when she won't tell him, he realizes that the first thing she's going to go, she, she's going to do is run to Anakin. And that rather than push her for the answer here, he would simply follow her. I put this little tone poem moment in here of all the dead Federation people and Anakin on the balcony contemplating what he's done. This is the first time he actually has a chance to think about what it is that's happened by himself. And the tear here says that he knows what he's done, but he has now committed himself to a path that he may not agree with, but he is going to go on anyway. It's the one moment that says he's self-aware, that he's he rationalizing all his behavior, he's doing terrible things, but in the end he really knows the truth. He knows that he's evil now, and there's nothing he can do about it. I mean, that's really the moment where the, I think the pathos of him getting stuck in that suit is real, because if he had to do it over, he probably wouldn't do it, but he can't stop it now. He kind of can see the rest of the movie, not in terms of him being defeated by Obi-Wan, but in terms of him going down a path that Padme can't follow and that the consequence that's going to have and the fact that he's going to have to battle Obi-Wan. He knows at that point he's going to have, this is all going to end up with a fight between him and Obi-Wan. He knows that Padme may not buy into this new reality and eventually she's going to sort of find out the truth. He made a pact with the devil and now he's become the devil. But it's not a joyful thing for him. It's a sad thing. The thing that she says at the very end is, I know they're still good at him, and that uh, Luke says later on in Return of the Jedi is they're still good at you. It's sort of a recurring, because there is. That's the one thing that will bring balance back to the Force, is there's just a little ounce of good in him. and It's his son that makes him realize that he made the wrong decision, and that it's the time for the rationalization is over and he needs to do the right thing, which is to get rid of the Sith and bring balance to the Force. The whole backstory that was done in 73 really just described the general things that happened, that Anakin turned to the dark side that she couldn't turn. And when she discovered that he was really more interested in power than he was in saving her, that she wouldn't have anything to do with him after that. So the, that was about all there was to this scene in terms of when they confront each other. It's really about her realizing that he's changed and that he's interested in becoming the emperor of the universe and that this isn't the guy she fell in love with he's turned into a monster and him in his possessiveness and his need for greed becoming extremely upset that she's not going to follow along and then when he sees obi-wan that sets him off Earlier, and through very incarnations of the script, there was much more of a, a, a personal jealousy between him and Obi-Wan, but I pulled that out. Now it's just she's betrayed him because she brought him there to kill him. One of the problems of Sith is that they're quick to anger. This scene with her, it was very important that we sort of set it up to the point where he chokes her, as he does with one of the generals in episode four. But at the same time, he doesn't kill her or anything. He just you know, causes her to faint, but that you get to see that flash of anger that he now doesn't really have much control over. The whole point of a Jedi is you can completely control your anger. Now he's at a point where he can't control it at all. And it's because of his, you know, need for control and power and being very upset when he doesn't have it. Obi-Wan's going to inevitably try to stop him. Don't make me kill you. And now... He, you know, he's assuming that she's in league with Obi-Wan, not necessarily in a love relationship or anything, but in the basis that they're both on one side of the path, or going down one path and he's going down the other. Sword fighting in this between Obi-Wan and Anakin is just really incredible. I mean, they practice this for like three months. It's not sped up, it's really the way it is, and they are really fighting hard. We went through several kinds of swords, bamboo and then metal, and then finally we ended with carbon fiber swords because they would bend them or break them. Or they were really hitting each other very hard, but they were moving very, very, very fast. It was astonishing to watch them on the set. Now this fight, when we get into it, I decided that eventually it would be partly like Yoda was in the last fight, but when we start out, it's mostly done with close-ups. 
there's a lot of pauses in it and not much fighting. And then later on it becomes a little bit like the old film where there's a lot of very fast fighting. And then we moved on to the pod sequence, which was to give it a different feel. But you see here, it's mostly they make moves, they stop, they make moves, they stop. It's not a lot of the really fast stuff that we're used to in the other film. I do a little of it later, but ultimately I wanted to get away from the sword fight into something more interesting and not quite so repetitive. Again, a vast amount of sword fighting in this film. The scene with them on the table, there was a whole beginning to the scene that got cut out where Obi-Wan got both of the swords, which is one of the reasons why Obi-Wan is holding Anakin's lightsaber in the beginning of that scene. This sequence where they're fighting was so fast on the set that when they finished this, the entire set broke out in applause. This is where the footage from Mount Etna really uh, comes in to play because you just couldn't do spewing volcanic lava. We can do it flowing, but you just can't do it being shot when it's really hard. And by getting the real deal, it made that whole sequence work. Because if we tried to do it with a computer or some kind of special effect, it just probably wouldn't have. I don't think we'd have ever gotten it right. Ian is so good in this. I mean, just this sequence, I, when I was shooting it, I was giggling the whole time. See, just so evil. You know, you just sit there and shoot it, and you can do take after take, and he's just this creepy, evil guy. I mean, let's say there's fun in that. I have to admit, when you got a really evil bad guy, it's sort of fun to watch him go to work. I saw it on the news that the volcano was erupting. I called Rick and I said, you gotta send somebody there right away. So the cameraman and assistant went to Italy, rented a camera, sat out there and shot volcano shots for a couple weeks. Well, we were really lucky. You know, I mean, we had three years, but you don't really plan on a volcano erupting, but it did. So it was our, our good luck in the, the part here where they hide behind the arm and the sound of the rocks hitting the side of the arm. It's a lot of very visceral. When we did this part where the arm falls, we had to have the part of the set. It's blue, it's all done in blue, but the set had to be able to spin and turn and be on different angles. And every day we would shoot it at a different angle to get it all to come out right. It's very laborious, I must say. This car that Bail Organa drives here is based on a Tucker. I mean, if you were to look at it very carefully. <laughs> it's another reference to one of my movies. I guess we should have put a THX license plate on it, but we forgot. <laughs> when we finished this sequence, we'd shot all of the fighting part, but this is one of those areas where we had had some dialogue earlier with them on the arm and in some other places that we cut out because it didn't seem to fit in the middle of all the fighting. But I still felt I needed to have some kind of confrontation with him, you know, dialogue confrontation with him in the end. And, and so this scene where they talk right here on the platforms, I shot later. Some of it was, was material that was actually in other places and some of it is, is new. But I felt it was important that there be some kind of a yelling match or something emotional right before they get into their final episode here. There's a lot of discussion about arrogance, both on the part of the Emperor and everybody else. And so the last real thing that uh, Anakin says, other than I hate you, is you underestimate my power, which is sort of the height of arrogance. But this little sequence down here with him crawling up the side of the volcano and then catching on fire is one of the primary images that was from the very, very beginning. The original backstory, before I even wrote the script to episode four, was this moment where he's climbing up the side of a volcano and catches on fire after uh, Obi-Wan cut off its arms and legs. And it was really this, it was really the image of this which is, that's how he got turned into Darth Vader. You know, just a little, it's like right this shot right here. It's kind of gruesome, but it's necessary to get him into that suit. And it's also tragic. It also had to be, this has to be done in a way that Obi-Wan thinks that he's killed him, but he hasn't. So I wanted the flames to last until Obi-Wan left and then they died down and got turned off, so to speak. 
Again, there's a lot in the movies which, in all six episodes, where different people say the same line under different circumstances, so it means different things, or it means the same things, or it's ironic. Um, here is one which is within this movie where the only thing she says is, is Anakin all right? And then when we get to Anakin, the first thing he says is, is, is Padme all right? Which is a kind of recurring technique that goes throughout the movies. It's And, and some of it's done as a joke, like, I have a bad feeling about this, and some of it's done purely as a, for irony or for, you know, some other reason, but it's purposely the exact same line repeated, tried in a way to use a kind of a musical motif on this where certain refrains keep continuing, and you keep coming back to them over and over again. This is a scene where originally the Emperor was pretty dark, and I had him brighten him up so that he's almost like death. He's this kind of almost white figure, I mean white-faced figure, rather than a more realistic version, which was very, very dark and, you know, like he would normally look under the circumstances, but I wanted him to have that kind of spooky um, death figure look about him. This sequence of her giving birth and uh, Anakin being turned into Darth Vader uh, originally was separate two separate scenes and then as we started editing they started intercutting them more and more and taking some of the other materials that were irrelevant out of it so that it really just cut from her to him to him to her and uh, uh, kept working it until we ended up with this, this final thing where the transitions are primarily from him to her and that uh, you know it's been broken up quite a bit because originally it was just she had the baby and then he became Darth Vader one, you know, one happened after the other this is where you can really it's hard to do it on a piece of paper but once you get the movie in your hands you can begin to see things and work with them and eventually they evolve into what's what feels right for the movie itself and just as the moment that he's born, she dies. So that, you know, we have that moment where he takes his first breath as Darth Vader, which is the symbol of him coming alive. And then that's followed by the scene of her saying there's still good in him and dying. And this, I went back and forth in terms of how much dialogue I was going to put in here. It became how much is too much for this scene. I wanted him to get a sense that he was like a Frankenstein monster that had been created when he came off the table, without making it too obvious, but at least give that sensation that the Emperor has created some kind of monster and that Anakin has actually become a monster, not only physically, but also in his soul. This particular scene with him all sort of tying everything up, it's a lot of exposition, and I tried to cut the film at one point with this all out because it really is just exposition of material that you know, really doesn't have to be there, but the film did not farewell with all this gone you know it's there's something very satisfying about having all the little pieces wrapped up but obi-wan in this scene there's there's just this hint and again there's a lot more to this but i cut it down to the very bare minimum but there's a hint of how obi-wan eventually in in episode four has learned to give up his his physical being and become one with the force and you understand here that his old Master Qui-Gon had something to do with it. His old Master Qui-Gon had been able to come back from the netherworld of the Force to somehow teach him how to do that. All the films end with a musical sequence where it's it's all visual and you know a minimum amount of effects. This has actually got the longest, most complicated version of that. But this one not only is an ending but it also ties up each story and brings it into where we're going to be in the next the next film this one there's a 20-year leap but each thing is you realize that princess leia is given to her adopted mother obviously there's a, a little bit of a stretch with the death star being started in this one and then 20 years later gets finished but you know they had supply problems and union disputes and a few design problems they had to work out. So it took longer than you would think, even for the Empire. Exactly how it is that Obi-Wan turns the baby over to Uncle Owen and Aunt Brew. 
and then goes off into the hills to over, you know, watch over him. I'd always felt that I wanted to end the movie on the image of the twin sons, which was such a strong image in episode four. It seems like the perfect icon for the movie because it really became the icon for episode four in my mind. The films are designed to be one movie. It started out as the tragedy of Darth Vader. It was meant to be one movie, episode four. You, you never knew what came ahead. You never knew what came behind. But in order to write it, I had to write a backstory first. It said who each of the characters were, where they come from. And the, the subtitle of the movie really was the tragedy of Darth Vader. It started out with this monster coming in, throwing everybody around, threatening people, choking guys. And halfway through the movie, you realize that the monster is actually a band. He's the father of the hero. Uh, and then at the end of the movie, you realize that the son inspires the monster, or the father, to be the hero of the movie. And that he'd been living this terrible life, you know, trapped in the suit, he'd sold his soul to the devil, and all that stuff was supposed to be stronger than it was when I ended up breaking it into three parts. And the icon of Darth Vader became so strong as the icon of evil. It was hard to sort of think of him as a tragic character. That's one of the things that made me go on and do the first three episodes so that you get more of a sense of how the whole story was. But ultimately, now, with this final piece in place, I hope people think of it as one movie and not as six little movies, but as one large movie and as the tragedy of Darth Vader, which is what it originally was meant to be. This movie was started out as one simple little movie that would take me about two years to make and then I'd go on to other things and it turned out to be 20 years of my life. And it was a real challenge to make and it sort of defined my life, which is not where I expected to be, but I'm, you know, very happy to have gone on this ride and met the challenges that the, the film presented to me and, and I'm happy with the way it turned out. I'm happy with all the episodes. Uh, I'm happy with the overall story uh, and I'm very relieved that I made it to the end, you know, to the finish line and the world is still here to see it.